a, an interesting and different format for the next session, uh, which is a panel discussion on ethical issues that arise in the context of genetic testing. Um, we wanted to include the perspectives of different communities in, in this conversation. So we've intentionally invited panel members from diverse backgrounds. And we're going to discuss two real world cases, one involving uh, Huntington's disease and the other involving Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the way it's going to work is that each panel member has been asked to take the lead on one of three questions that we've posed with regard to these, to these two real world cases. And so one person will take the lead and the other two will respond uh, to what they've said and then we'll go to the next question. So it's, that's the format we've decided on. And fortunately, Jill Goldman, uh, who is a member of the steering committee of our center, has agreed to serve as moderator for the discussion. Uh, Ms. Goldman is a genetic counselor at Columbia University Serjevsky Center and Taub Institute, and also the Parkinson's Disease and Other Movement Disorders Center. She counsels and does research on hereditary dementias and movement disorders, and leads support groups for early stage dementia patients uh, and frontotemporal dementia patients, or caregivers, actually, in conjunction with the Alzheimer's Association. She also initiated an interesting program called A Friend for Rachel uh, that trains pre-medical students about dementia and caregiving and pairs them with a person living with dementia. So now I'm going to introduce our three panel members um, uh, seated on, on immediately on my right is Suzanne Carter. Uh, Ms. Carter is a board certified genetic counselor who's provided counseling to many, many patients, thousands of patients, and also co-teaches reproductive genetics at the uh, Joan H. Marks Human Genetics Program at Sarah Lawrence. Um, she is also an attorney uh, who practices in New York and New Jersey and specializes in social security disability, elder law, and other aspects of family law. And she was inspired to go to law school by a case involving the patent and licensing of genetic information discovered through use of the participants' tissue donations. This is called Greenberg versus Miami Children's Hospital Research Institute. Thank you for, for being with us. Um, in the middle, uh, we have Chaim Jalas, who is the Director of Genetic Resources and Services at Bonet Al Olam, a nonprofit organization that assists couples with infertility and genetics in the Orthodox Jewish community. He is also founding director of the Center for Rare Jewish Genetic Disorders, and he's conducted many scientific studies of families with undiagnosed diseases and published on a number of new disease genes and Ashkenazi-specific mutations. He's also helped many families move forward with a diagnosis and a clinical path for conceiving healthy babies via pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And then uh, on, on the far right, uh, your far left, I guess, um, we have Alejandro Iglesias. Dr. Iglesias is assistant professor of pediatrics and director of the Inherited Metabolic Disorders Program uh, and also program director of the Genetics Residency Program and attending physician in the Division of Medical Genetics, Department of Pediatrics at Columbia. He's a clinical and biochemical geneticist primarily interested in dysmorphology, inherited metabolic disorders, and neurogenetics. He's deeply involved in all aspects of the medical genetics residency program at Columbia, and is also responsible for the medical biochemistry lecture series for first-year medical students at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. 
So thank you all very much for joining us. So we are very excited about this panel, um, and we will ask our uh, three very different participants to respond to um, certain questions, both from a professional and a personal point of view. So I'm going to read um, our scenarios first, and then there are pointed questions that we will uh, be dealing with. So a 31-year-old woman who was at risk for Huntington's disease came to HD clinic with her husband for counseling regarding family planning. When given the options, they decided on non-disclosing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. It was clear to the clinical team that she had signs and symptoms um, of HD, but neither the patient nor her husband wanted to have an, examina an examination or genetic testing. The team explored scenarios with the patient and her husband separately, focusing on the possibility that she would develop the disease and on how her parenting abilities might decline so that a strong support system would be necessary. This woman was brought to the HD Center six years later at age 37 after an emergency department visit with her son. The police had suspected that she had been drinking because her speech was slurred. In the interim, since having her children, she had become increasingly argumentative with her family and was now unable to care for her children alone. In retrospect, the family recognized involuntary movements even during pregnancy. So question one. Given that this woman appeared to be experiencing symptoms of a progressive disabling disorder, was it reasonable to refer her for a procedure that would lead to the birth of a child? Hi, am. Sure. Is it on? It's on. It's working? Yeah. So, of course, it's my opinion only. I can't speak for others. It doesn't seem that. The woman or the family. It doesn't seem that the woman or the family were asking us if she should have a child. It sounds that they came for options and they might have known that she's positive. Um, and they came to, to discuss non-disclosure non PGD. Um, given the support system in the family, I think it's reasonable to offer her PGD because we assume already she's positive. And if we could help her with a decision that she's made that PGD is ethical for her, I think it's um, reasonable to offer PGD in a way that the child will not have to go through what the parent is going through right now. If it's ethical for the family and there are family members who will take care of the, um, of the child. Um, as a society, we don't tell people when to have or if to have children. We, we give them options. and. Um, I don't think it would be fair for us to discourage this family of having a child if they've come to us and asked us for options. And one of the options is PGD non-disclosure because she's not interested in knowing about it. And I think that is, um, if it's ethical to the family, it's fine for us to offer it. Either of the other two you want, want to respond to that? <coughs> well, yeah. Oops. Uh, so I guess, um, you know, I guess we can approach this in two different ways. Clearly, in all these cases that we were even talking before, uh, we have, I would say, some sort of theoretical framework that is more related with ethics and the principles of ethics that clearly in all these cases we're going to see that they're colliding to each other, what is usually happens. And the other part clearly is, well, what, as you said, we personally think about this or from a more practical point of view what we do with this so going back to what he was saying clearly every couple has you know the right to have children question here and I don't know if the history is complete or not 
So going back to the way this supposedly should happen, at least what I would do in the clinic, is clearly all this has to be clearly discussed with this couple. So it's obvious that they came with this knowledge that probably she had the thing. That's why they asked for non-disclosure in terms of testing the baby, or in this case doing PGD. But the whole part about her being symptomatic, and this clearly links to the next question that actually was addressed to me, if we, our duty Don't get was... Don't here. <laughs> well, the thing is, if our duty was sort of to refer, I mean, first to bring forward that she actually had symptoms, and second, to alert the obstetrician that this was happening. So, and here is, I guess, where all these principles collide. So, if we are thinking about the patient herself, well, clearly we have a duty f to warn her that she's actually having a symptom, although she might say no. But the question is, if I take a whole family history, if I get all the information from them, it's going to be clear to me that this patient is having symptoms. And even I would say, besides the hunting tongue, the patient has symptoms. So the next thing is, when she goes to see the obstetrician during the pregnancy, clearly the obstetrician is going to see that the patient has symptoms, neurological symptoms. If they are due to hunting tongue or something else, well, we don't know. We assume that probably they are. So that's where you know the problem starts. So I would say, if this couple is completely aware of this beforehand, and and the second part of this, I'm sorry I'm getting too much, but is we start going back and think about the child. So although this I'm gonna get into you know very you know difficult waters here and so, so you know we are talking about you know, the autonomy of the person the people participate in this, well what about the fetus? What about the child? If we are harming this kid that is going to get a mother that won't be able to take care of him or her. So, but again, I guess if all this is explained clearly to the couple, said, okay, listen, even if without telling her, you have symptoms, I've seen you in front of me, well, you might develop this. So how are you going to take care of your child in the future? So let's run this way. If you discuss Huntington disease or any other disease that is similar, that we know is going to evolve in a certain way, well, you explain that to the patient. So, okay, I can understand you don't want to know, but if you have it, all these things are going to happen to you. So, all these things are going to impact your own health, and it's going to impact your marriage, and it's going to impact your future children. So, I guess if all that is clear, and they acknowledge that they understand all that, and at that point they ask for PGD, I would say, okay, go ahead. Okay, so not to complicate things or no. anything, but... Um, I would jump, jump <laughs> into the next question. So, um, so oh, yeah. yeah, well, uh, Suzanne can re respond to that, or I can add to it, and then, oh. should I add to the scenario and then sure. have you respond? Okay, so... Um, my belief is that everything was done the way you said. However, the, the patient herself did not acknowledge symptoms. <coughs> that was clearly understood she, that she was at 50% risk for uh, developing HD, but not acknowledging that she already was displaying any symptoms. And as, as Mary said, um, you know, the physical symptoms can come second. So she w was also experiencing some both cognitive and psychiatric symptoms that the, the clinic was aware of, but the patient and her husband were not aware of. In that case, if the patient is not acknowledging or in her partner and they're not acknowledging symptoms, it's a matter of going back through the counseling and your observations, asking the patient about different aspects of her life. Has she noticed any differences in what she, in her abilities to, um, to do things, any differences in her interactions with people, and maybe going, getting at the, uh, her symptoms that way so that she can come to some self-recognition? Further comments? 
I think it's up to the IVF clinic to make sure that she understands. Uh, when she presents to the IVF center, it's up to their duty to make sure that she... We can't tell her that she's positive or negative. Obviously, they will know if she's positive or negative by testing the embryos, usually, if they're doing the mutation testing, depending how they're setting up the non-disclosure. But making sure that she is um, capable of, at that point at least, is up for discussion. And usually the IVF centers refer to psychiat psychiatric evaluations for families in these situations. Okay, question two. Should the team in the center have confronted her with the fact that she appeared to be symptomatic so that she and her family could have engaged in a more reasonable process of life planning? Alejandro? Well, we we just yeah. addressed this, yeah. at least from our point of view. And, and, and I would, sorry, I would add, and we have the lawyer here, so it's <laughs> pretty good. So without, <laughs> no, no, without even getting into, you know, the legal, potential legal, you know, repercussions of this, although she knows much better than us that, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's not too many actual cases out, and even, you know, in some cases, things went one way or the other. So I guess from the other point of view, our, and this is an interesting thing, you know, I was, you know, reading at some point about this, that asking geneticists about this type of issues, so on one hand, almost 70% of them were sort of, you know, pro-disclosing the things. But what was very surprising is that they were asking, well, if the, their society, so my society, have any, any say on this, and most of them didn't have any clue. So what is quite interesting. So actually, you know, the American Society of Human Genetics is the only body that has been making some sort of, you know, statements about this. That is basically at the end related with this, you know, duty of, you know, warn people or respecting, you know, the the right to know or know, disclosing that is the other part and maybe go in the second case about, you know, the impact that genetic information might have in other family members. So we can leave it for the next case, but yeah. <clears throat> the fact that she wanted non disclosure P G D means she really does not want to know if she's positive or negative. And she might be doing IVF for no good reason, because she's negative. But she really does not want to know, so she's going to spend 25000 or whatever not to know. I don't think it's fair to confront her in any way, because she really came to us saying, I don't want to know, and I think we have to respect her choice of, I don't want to know, even if she can clearly have symptoms. I've met people which... <laughs> almost 99% sure are positive for various diseases and they don't want to know, so their choice. That's an excellent point that uh, with her symptoms being suggestive of HD, suppose she has another condition. Interesting. Okay, third question. Should the team have communicated their suspicions that she was symptomatic to the woman's physician, so her PCP or her OBGYN, so that they could monitor her status and refer her for treatment as soon as she, as her symptoms became a problem? I'm going to make the big assumption that she was referred to the center by another medical provider. In that case, as Dr. Chung says, you cover your ass. Uh, <laughs> and when you are sending back your your findings to the referring provider, you're going to include what you discussed with the patient, what recommendations you made, and what her findings were. Once that information goes back to her primary care provider, then the primary, primary care provider has a responsibility to refer the patient perhaps to neurology or make other suggestions I see Dr. Wexler shaking her head. No, <laughs> do not refer to neurology. Okay, fine, we will not. <laughs> but, uh, but as I said, if the, there's a primary care doctor, you report all of your findings to the primary care doctor. And for the obstetrician gynecologist, the information could be important as to whether these symptoms could have implications for um, pregnancy complications or labor complications. So, so, well, 
this kind of goes back to what we were discussing before. So clearly, you know, as was said, the patient doesn't want to know. So either she probably knows that she has symptoms, she doesn't want to know. So we have to respect that. Of course, the other part is eventually she's going to go to the obstetrician, and the obstetrician is going to examine her and is going to realize that she has symptoms of some sort of neurological thing. So even from the general obstetric care, well, that physician has a duty to explain to this patient that he noticed this, this, and this. So at that point, probably the discussion is going to be brought again. And so, well, listen, you have neurological symptoms. This pregnancy might be at risk. So the duty of the, that physician is to at least to tell her. Of course, she's an adult, so she has the autonomy to decide, well, I understand what you're telling me, but I don't want you to do anything. That is kind of the same thing that applies to the first doctor and even the IVF team. So again, I guess it's a matter of full disclosure about what's happening here. And now actually going to the legal part that I guess is very important. All this must be documented in the medical records. So if I talk to this lady and the husband, I get all this information, well, I will tell her, well, I'm going to make my notes. Whatever I observe in here are going to be in my chart. So this is there. Because otherwise, what might happen is that when this lady is found to supposedly be drunk, and she probably wasn't, so maybe she gets back to me and say, well, you know, seven years ago, you didn't tell me about this. So now I'm suing you because you didn't warn me about what's happening and I was driving and maybe I got killed. Or well, let's say she got killed, the husband sued me because I didn't tell them that she was having these problems, meaning she wasn't able to drive. So clearly this can go forever, one way or the other. So again, at the end of the day, I guess, at least what we do in genetics, full disclosure of this, using some sort of very thorough informed consent and acknowledging for all parties that this is what it is, and at the end respecting the autonomy of the patient is probably the way that I would go with this. So can I pipe up? Okay. Absolutely. <clears throat> and let me try to walk you through her mind, through her husband's mind. And Mary was talking about this before. When we didn't have any way of knowing, 100% of people said, I want to know if there were a test, I'd take it tomorrow. People massively symptomatic. They could go to a clinician and get diagnosed. When there is a test, everybody's voting with their feet. There is nothing, absolutely, you can do. There is no treatment. There is nothing you can do that actually makes a difference. Very few things. This couple is coming to you. They both are saying, I don't want to know. I know many people, massively symptomatic. They don't want to know. Very, people will say, well, you know, Huntington's patients deny. And that becomes very stigmatizing. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear somebody saying, I want to know, how can I help you? How can I establish a relationship with you? She's saying she wants non-disclosing PGD. Non-disclosing means I don't want to know. Don't tell me how many embryos. Don't tell my husband. She's saying I want to do something that's going to help the next generation. I say bravo. She wants to have next generation healthy, great. Refer her. She's not asking for you to clob her on the head. Yeah, oh no, you know, your baby's going to be at risk because if you, have a, you get pregnant, it's going to bring out your symptoms. We don't know that. Lots of people with massive Huntington's have babies all the time. It doesn't make them any more symptomatic. You know, Venezuela, people have babies in their 40s and they have Huntington's. So there's nothing really medically. I think what you need to do is establish a relationship. It sounds like you're kind of trying to do, get to know her, find out how can you help her. And if helping her is doing non-disclosing, PGD, great. And go for it. Very would, it would it make any difference if I said that um, 
y you were assuming the support system was good. If I told you the support system wasn't good, would it make any difference to anybody in terms of I mean, we've been talking uh, talking about the woman's rights, the, the couple's rights, but what about the child's rights? It went okay. over there. <laughs> she's just going to have a baby that perpetuates it. Because <clears throat> she's not going to go get tested. You don't help her. She's just going to have a baby that's going to have Huntington's. Okay, Very so, so, so you're saying that, that if, the, if the team confronted her about her symptoms, she would leave and do her oh, own 100%. thing? A hundred percent. I think, I think that um, the number one thing to do is to keep the patient in treatment. The more she's in treatment, the more you have an opportunity to influence the situation, not necessarily her choice, because it is not our choice. It is her choice whether she, she chooses to have kids. And it's her choice to determine how she wants to do it. If we put up a great big wall and start creating all these complications around her, she's not going to do her best. Um, so the, the only thing is that, you know, we, th we think about offering people a test and making sure that they're fully informed about all the consequences of it. And can they tell you back that they understand it and all that. In this situation, though, I wonder, is it necessary to ask for informed consent not to do it? So if they can articulate their reasons why they don't want to do it, can they, can they explain that? Because, and, and it's not like they have to justify anything to me, but, um, you know, people with Huntington's who have early motor signs also tend to not be aware that they have motor signs. And depending upon her husband, how connected he is with um, the rest of the family who might know a whole lot about Huntington's, he doesn't know anything. He says, well, you know, this is until you've got Korea, you don't have Huntington's, which I hear all the time. People with, you know, this stage of Huntington's can just look fidgety. They just look nervous. They don't it's not necessarily this obvious person who has a motor disorder. Um, so my question would be, and particularly of her husband, is so just explain to me your thinking about this, just more to see if he really is informed. That's all. It's not to create a judgment of any kind, but just to make certain that he, they both fully understand enough about Huntington's to know um, it, if they just have enough information about Huntington's in general. But you'd have to do it in a very delicate way, and you'd have to do it so that the patient remains in treatment. That's it. So let, let me ask, ask you a question, too. So I agree about <clears throat> the first part of this. So she seeks counseling. She asks for the PGD, all this stuff. Fine. So she gets pregnant. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the obstetrician starts taking care of her. So the obstetrician notices that she has neurological symptoms. So what the obstetrician is going to do? If I'm the obstetrician, it's like I'm a pediatrician. So if I see a baby in my clinic and I touch the belly and I feel something that is abnormal, I cannot walk away and say to this mother, well, I won't tell you that your baby has a tumor in the belly because you came here to ask me about a spot in the skin. So the first part, as I said, I agree because it's a pure counseling session. It's very specific. I completely agree with you that this couple make their decision. They have the reasons. So how this translate into medical care in the next step when this lady is pregnant? Because the pediatrician might say, well, if I don't tell this lady that she's having tremors, well, she might trip and she might kill herself or she might kill the baby or something can happen. So in that case, as a physician, the duty to warn this and to disclose what's happening, I guess it's also at play. That's why at the beginning I was saying that clearly all these principles are in collision here. So how we can resolve the second part, and even without, you know, 
warning this of situation. I just let it go, but she's going to see it or she's going to see it. So how this scenario is going to play in this second step? Well, can I just make one quick comment about that? So these, these people have made a choice that they want to go through this process mm -hmm. independent of that knowledge, which means they have to accept the consequences of that which means they may walk into a provider who knows zero about Huntington's, mm -hmm. and they may have it disclosed in a very unkind way, or in a very pejorative way, or a very, um, in a way, in an attempt to influence them. They have made the choice to expose themselves to that consequence. I don't think that we can think no, but the about that consequence. That I'm, not, I'm not talking about Huntington's in the second scenario. I'm talking about a symptomatic patient with something that, as you said, I'm the obstetrician. I know nothing about this story. I examined the patient because it's my duty to do it, and I found that neurologically she's abnormal. So what am I going to do? I Clearly, I would go back to her history. I'm going to realize all the things you said. So what I will do, I proceed very cautious. I won't disclose anything like a bomb. So probably I would do, I just contact the other people, talk to the other people, find out what they did. But eventually, sooner or later, I cannot follow this lady for nine months, seeing her deteriorating in front of me, doing nothing. I mean, that is, I com that is born in negligence. I so completely agree with you about ha that. However, that's not what happened. Huh? That's not what happened. What happened what? Because this woman did go through PGD, no, well, she but, did go. Yeah, but we are, you know, playing different scenarios. But, but in the real world, that doesn't necessarily right. happen well, because. But this can happen regardless yeah. if she did PGD or not. This is nothing. Whatever happens by her OBGYN's office could be a natural conception, could be a PGD conception. The OBGYN is stuck, not knowing any information, and will tell her that something is going on and go, go, go check so it out. What? So when, when, well, but when the obstetrician disclosed that, as she said, this lady that is very smart, clearly, is going to think back and said, oh, this guy is telling me that actually I have Huntington's, and I want to know about this. So I think it goes back to what you're, like we, we said before, the question is what's the informed consent? When you describe the situation with her, you need to tell her you basically have two choices. One is to get the genetic testing and get it in a, protected environment or a, 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 a trained environment, or it is possible that one day someone on the street will tell you, and you need to make a choice of what do you want. Do you want it to be disclosed in a way that the, and tested in a formal way, or would you rather find out about it some di sometime when an unskilled clinician uh, just tells you, oh, this is what I saw? And that's part of the informed consent. It sounds very clear with this case that she chose not to know. I, I don't think there's any way to spin it, and that's why, uh, regarding the question number three that, uh, that you were asked, I think it's not a wise idea to send a note to the PCP or OBGYN documenting your exam. I would document, as I've done as a neurologist, is exam is not documented by patient's request. And uh, if someone comes to me and says, I don't want to know, I'm saying, okay, so I'm not examining you. Because I, if I examine, I need to document. But also, I think that people, it's not that obvious. You know, it's not, pe people's symptoms are not that obvious. Seven years later, a cop thought she was drunk. So it's not like you examine somebody and it's instantly obvious what's Huntington's. Dr. Edmondson um, made a good point. In your chart note, you should be documenting why a patient accepts testing as well as why a patient does not accept testing. Second point is the statute of limitations for medical malpractice <laughs> in New York is two and a half years. Okay, cool. All right. If we have time at the end, we can come back. But let's go on to our second case. Okay. So Mrs. L was a 59-year-old woman with a three-year history of progressive cognitive impairment starting with memory loss. A complete neurological evaluation resulted in a diagnosis of probable early onset Alzheimer's disease, which often has a genetic etiology. At the time of the initial evaluation, Mrs. L was very forgetful and had word finding problems. She was still working, but was having problems at work because of anxiety. 
Mrs. L had a substantial family history of dementia, a sister with early onset memory problems, and her father, paternal grandmother, and two paternal uncles who died in their 70s with dementia. She was terrified that she would end up the same way as her father and had refused evaluation until now. Mrs. L's husband asked whether genetic testing would make any difference in her diagnosis or treatment, and the counselor said it would not but it would provide information for other family members who might wish to find out their own, if, whether they carried the mutation. Okay. Mrs. L and her husband returned a month later, this time with their younger son, David. The husband and son stated that they would like Mrs. L to have genetic testing so that the information would be available to the son and perhaps to his sister for future reproductive decisions. Mrs. L still seemed upset. When asked if she wanted to be tested, she said, I guess so. She said she would do it for David, but was scared that her children would get the disease. Mrs. L agreed to sign the consent and blood was drawn. The results were positive for a presenilin 1 mutation. Okay, the first question. Is Mrs. L being coerced into testing and if so, how should the clinic respond? Alejandro? So, well, I guess, again, let's go back to, on one hand, I mean, the one big thing here is how competent or not she is. So, because this is an important thing. Assuming that she is, because clearly, before and after, she expressed clearly that at the beginning, she was afraid about knowing about herself. Later on, she was afraid about the son having this. So I guess it's clear that we can discuss with this lady all these issues. So the next part is, well, initially, she didn't want to do anything. And now we got the father and the son coming back with her. And now she said, well, I'm afraid about my son. And so eventually, she agrees. So. I would say in a very loose way, we might say that is some coercion here, but on the other hand, we don't know the whole story. So clearly, she maybe changed her mind. She talked to the father, she talked to the son, maybe they did some sort of agreement. Again, I guess at the end of the day, it's a matter of how clear this is where this conversation happened. So if we ask this family, well, do you discuss this? You understand this? And they said, yes, we do. Well, clearly, I would say it sounds like coercion, but they are not just you know, putting a gun on her head. She, now it's more concerned about the son and not that concerned about herself. So, and, and sorry, this goes back you know, to how knowing about something can impact you know, family members. And again, from the physician point of view, if we have a duty to intervene or not. So again, going back to what I said about the American Society of Human Genetics, you know, the statement basically says, and again, you know, we are just, you know, bordering the legal issues here, that unless, you know, it's an extreme, you know, scenario where it's, you know, life-threatening situation or the intervention is gonna change, it's usually the autonomy that has to be respected. So eventually I would say we need to have a very you know frank discussion with this family and if they actually agree in front of us and they acknowledge that well now she changed her mind well i guess we can test yeah go ahead how old is his son in his 20s and he wants to have children now uh, eventually he thinks he wants to have children okay. yes. i think the best compromise would have been to ask the mom for permission to store a dna sample it really sounds that she does not want to know, and it doesn't seem that the son can do anything to protect himself, even with the gene. And um, if he wants to know later on, he can always choose to have his mother tested at any date. That would be a fair compromise. It sounds that we are pushing this mother into testing when she does not want to know, but the only choice for the son to make reproductive decisions, being that he's asymptomatic, is to have the mother tested. But I think we can try to do that at a point when it's really necessary for 
The woman sounds ambivalent about testing either f testing in terms of whether she wants information about herself or whether she wants information that her children could make use of. Since there's no emergency at this point, I, you have the luxury of time. You can always reschedule ha and have the patient come back. Another possibility is, is can the son himself be tested without knowing the mother, um, without knowing if the mother has a mutation, another option. Okay, so let's, let's just address that. Um, in terms of early onset Alzheimer's disease, there are three different possible genes. Um, and as Dr. Chung said, the more genes you test, the more likely you're gonna have, find variants of unknown significance. Um, so without testing the person who is affected, if you get um, either, uh, uh, if you test just one gene um, and you get a negative result, you don't know if you've tested the right gene. If you get a variant of unknown significance and haven't tested the affected family member, you can make no judgment on, on whether that uh, variation is, is pathogenic or not. Yeah, and also if the mom was negative for those three genes, there is nothing, we still, right. it can right. be genetic, we don't know. So without testing the mom, we really can't say anything about the son's risk. Are there yeah. other people in the family that could be tested? Uh, I think her, f her father had passed away, so we have an autosomal dominant family history, but nobody else to test. Their uncles. They, were, they also had passed. Her sister was, was uh, possibly symptomatic. I don't think that there's a major question about her diagnosis. No. And I don't think that her anxiety is about herself. It's about her son. So I think that testing her is not that big of an ethical question in my eyes because she has, she doesn't have a question about her condition. The, the being positive or negative means doesn't mean much to her, except for the kids that she's anxious about. The kids want to know. So if there's any ethical question, it's maybe about the daughter that is not involved in the discussion. But other than that, that if she agrees and the son wants her to get tested, but, I'm okay with it. Okay, so the issue really is her guilt and her confronting the fact that she could have passed the gene down. Well, did, did and whether to be explained that, that logical she, or not may have something to do with her condition as well. Whether we find the gene or not, she's still a carrier of an autosomal dominant Alzheimer's gene that probably has 50% chance of transferring it to the kid. The fact we found it or didn't find it is just our technology in 2014. So it's not that she's more likely to have transferred it if we found a gene or if we didn't. No, this is a very family. clear dominant case. There is something to the power of not knowing. I, yeah. I've met many families, they just don't, not confirming, not knowing, me and you can think they're positive, it's dominant, it came from her father, she just doesn't want to know, she's stupid. She's not stupid, she just really doesn't want to know, and I agree, it's the guilt of the son, so that's why my question is, when the son needs to know, it's correct. I think I would support testing her as well. Okay. Yeah, store the sample. We had the option of storing a sample, but chances are that she will still be alive when that sample gets tested if a 20-something-year-old, you know, son is, is going to use the information, you know, for reproductive decisions. So um, the main difference would, might be that she wouldn't have capacity at that point and couldn't make her own decisions. So that's legally what would that look well, she, like. She gave consent. She's given consent for her stored sample to be used mm -hmm. at some point, w so. Okay. I just want to ask uh, one question here. Uh, I think if, if there is any coercion, it's obviously a no-no, and the idea that you could store the sample gives another option. But I'm a little concerned about the idea that if a mother wants to do something to help her children, and that's part of her decision-making process, why are we calling that coercion? I, I just, it's like a very, yeah, I, I, I just, it's not obvious to me that that's coercion. I mean, I, yes, she's influenced because, she, because her kids want it, but you know, if she had food on the table and her kids didn't, she'd give her food away. I mean, why are we not giving her the benefit of the doubt and saying 
that um, doing something to help her children is, is a free decision on her part. The way the question reads, it seems as though it's a question of whether she has the ability or capacity to make that decision. And if she doesn't, then you could be looking at coercion or maybe she's just ambivalent at that time. Which gets into the next question, which is how does... So, dim oh, let, let, let's going back to yeah, what you just said, I mean, it's somehow, you know, kind of what I would say at the beginning. So it looks like that somehow she changed her mind. She still, you know, has the capacity to think straight. And I agree, if it gets to the point that she says, although, you know, in the way that the question is, you know, it's written down, so it looks like she, she's hesitant about this. But I say, well, I guess so. Well, it looks like she, now she wants to help, you know, the son. So at that point, clearly, is what you said. It could be done right away. The DNA could be stored. So, but it looks like that the dynamic of this family have changed. So I guess that's the thing that has to be clearly discussed with them. So if eventually, I mean, they seem to be very intelligent people. So if we get some sort of agreement about this, well, even we can make these next steps, as you said. So, well, you want to do this now, or as a son, well, you know, you want to store this from your mother, so and so. Clearly, as you said, if eventually there's a doubt about how competent she is, it's a different story. Okay. So, next question. How does diminished capacity influence a genetic counseling session and inform consent for genetic testing? Capacity is going to influence it in that if the per whether the person has the, has the ability to understand the risk benefits and limitations of testing and can freely give consent. In this particular case, is the woman ambivalent or does she have diminished capacity? It's not easy to tell because one, capacity can be on a sliding scale. If you've seen people who have memory loss, dementia, some days they're sharp as a tack of a day's their ability to recognize you may not may not be there second question is going uh, second question that will come up if she doesn't have the capacity to consent does her husband or her son have the uh, the authority to consent for her is her health care proxy in place is she deferring to one, deferring to one or both of them to make that um, make that decision for her, and all of that has to be sorted out. Comments? Well, so I, I agree with you. So it's uh, the, the question will be if we get to the point where it's a doubt about if she is capable or not, how we're going to proceed with that. So clearly, the next step, as you said, if we already know that she is not capable. This is not competent. So, well, what you said, we have to figure out if it's a proxy or not or how this. But let's say we are in this gray area. We don't know. So how we can approach this considering that she doesn't want to know. So it's, it gets back to like the other case. So, so you know what? Now I want to know if you are actually competent or not. So I'm going to send you for an evaluation. So I guess that it's not the way to go. So how we might resolve that so, so what if it was clear when she was still competent that she didn't want testing and then she was declared incompetent and the family wanted testing? Well, it goes back to what she said. So. If at that point there's been, I would say this, in this particular case, if the woman has been appointed a guardian by the court, then the guardian has the authority to make decisions for this woman based upon certain, um, maybe based upon certain powers granted by the court. And whoever is in that position will need to think about what this person would have wanted, look at the risk benefits and um, limitations of what the medical procedure, or in this case the genetic testing is, and either say yes or no, or um, say yes, the genetic testing should be done, or no, it should not. It's a very, uh, it's not an easy position to be in, 
when you have to when you have to make decisions for a person and you may or may not have a clear cut idea of what the person would have wanted um, for him or herself. Can't hear. Oh. So if a person lacks capacity, um, then I don't know how things are in New York, but in North Carolina, it's assumed that your spouse is the person who acts on your behalf unless there's a guardian in place, unless there's um, a health care power of attorney that states otherwise. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this rank, like spouse, you know, uh, majority opinion of children, et cetera. And, and, and I think that's not true in mental health, but it is true in a medical facility and in a medical hospital. That, I mean, those are the laws in North Carolina. I don't know how that works. In it's, the, the, it's the same here. I, I'm just interested, Haim, um, could you talk a little bit about in the um, Orthodox Jewish community, if we were in that situation um, where she hadn't been tested um, because she didn't want to be tested, but then you know, her son is trying to make reproductive decisions, uh, what, would, what would the community say? I'm not a rabbi, I don't, I, don't <laughs> I think it's a family specific, but the question I would pose the other way. What happens is she's clearly not capable of making any decisions and she has a health proxy, but she wrote in her will, I should never be tested under no conditions. Do you think the health proxy could override that? No. Where's our lawyer? Come on. <laughs> we need the lawyer. Okay. We need a lawyer after that. <laughs> I may have to call for a lifeline. <laughs> Generally, your will should be reserved for things that you want to leave to people after you pass. Uh, certain directives such as I never want to be tested are best left for your health care proxy because your will in, is, in essence doesn't come into effect until after you die. Therefore, if this woman is living and is written in her will, I never want to be tested, technically if she were to die then you could not take tissue samples from her for genetic testing. Dr. Could I also just um, make a comment? Uh, I think that having a really good uh, tissue repository is a fabulous um, way to help families and cope with these decisions. Let's say there's actually a treatment, a cure, specifically for presenolin 1, for presenolin 2. There's antibodies. It really is critical for medical reasons to know what she has and she no longer is able to make this decision. She's living in limbo so she can't give informed consent. Um, it, but if she died it might be easier because once you die, you know, uh, people, you know, you don't even have capacity after you die. <laughs> even if you wanted to, if you want to give your brains and tissue and everything. So I think having a really uh, good uh, tissue repository, a biobank, I think we need to really think about what are the informed consents we put in place so that people can say, yes, please store it, please. Or, you know, or they might say, no, never test. But they might say, if there's something that can help my family, go ahead and test it. And certainly with our gen you know, with genome sequencing, there are things we can do that will be very specific to these changes, these mutations, and we ought to think about the good side of genetic information. So I, I didn't mean to brush away the question. I, I think genetics, as much as it's personal, it also impacts the whole family. And decisions by one member of the family, so let's assume she was never tested and the kids don't want to know and half of the kids do want to know and one goes and tests themselves for seven genes and finds they're positive. So now we know what mom had, obviously, because one of the kids has it. And now the siblings know they're at 50% risk. Did that child have to ask their siblings to do it on themselves? The answer is no, but we just diagnosed the mom 
by having the child themselves tested. So there's always a family situation. And I'll tell you a story. You asked about an Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox family. There's a woman with a familiar, familiar cancer syndrome, which we don't know till now which one it is. Multiple family members dying very young. And she was diagnosed, and unfortunately, she had a stroke right afterwards. So she consented for testing after part of the family told her, at least get the three Ashkenazic mutations tested. She really would, was not interested in being tested at all, but she consented to the lab that we'll have only the three Ashkenazic mutations tested. Half of the family was very upset. Half of the family was very happy. She, she tested negative. Mm -hmm. And the family called me, and I said, well, there's about 30 genes you can test today. Mom did not consent for that. So the part of the family that, that says no testing says no testing for the 30 genes. Mom is not alive. Do the children who want testing have a right to that DNA sample sitting in the lab to be tested? We came to compromise, and the answer was she can be tested, and the other kids don't need to know the results. Obviously, she was okay with part testing because she agreed to the Ashkenazic. I don't know why the discussion went that way, because it doesn't have to be one of those three Ashkenazic mutations. But... I think people who don't want to know have a right not to know, and they don't have to know. It's not forced on them. Obviously, there's something cancer genetic in the family. We don't need to do a DNA t test for that. We know it. And um, if they choose to ignore their risk, that's fine. But I think the others have a right to know their own risk based on the mom's sample. So it was very complicated, but it was no lawyers involved. It was at least <laughs> the family getting together and coming up with the decision. So. Great. <coughs> Yeah, we do. Okay, so the last question is, what is the proper role of the family in decisions about genetic testing? I think we've answered some of this. Um, when test results might have implications for several family members and different family members disagree. So you, that's exactly what you just addressed. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can come to some agreement sometimes with the families without having to fight over it. So, but I, I would just like to say that um, uh, we've all talked about the importance of pretest counseling, and all these issues always come up in pretest counseling. You know, who in the family wants to know, who doesn't want to know? Um, are family secrets uh, a good thing? How are you going to keep them? Um, and and that needs to be out there before a family uh, goes into genetic testing. Just Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. Well, just a comment about this last question. So I guess also, you know, what also matters here is although half of the family was trying to know and the other no. So the other part, especially, you know, for cancer, it's the matter of if interventions can actually save the lives of these people instead of letting go. So it's in that case where things get a little more complicated because, again, the question is, well, respecting the autonomy of the lady who signed just for something but not for everything, and now you have family members that are kind of arguing, I want to know because if I know, I might be alive, and if I don't know, I won't. So in that case, of course, the half that doesn't want to know has the right, as you said, to not to know what it has to be respected question is what we do with the other half of the family. So, and that's <clears throat> when, you know, this limit about, you know, the autonomy and the breach of the autonomy, it's, you know, it's present because the question is, well, if it's an intervention, intervention actually is effective and can save the life of the patient, well, it's a theoretical possibility of actually breach that. So, but again, you know, I don't think we have simple answer for all this. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, we could go on forever. <laughs>